Welcome to The Log Church Online. I'm Pastor Luke, and we are so glad you're with us today, wherever you happen to be watching from. If you're new to The Log Church, please let us know by filling out our online connection card. We'd like to send you a free copy of Kill My Fear by Pastor Sam Linson. And with everything going on in our lives today, fear and anxiety can easily start to take over. This book will give you all the weapons you need to kill your fear. Make sure you stay tuned for some discussion questions that you can talk about with your friends and family at the conclusion of the service. Right now, it's time to worship. Turn up that volume and let's sing His praises.
Thank you again for being with us. And if you're looking to get your midweek worship on, make sure you follow the Log Church worship page on Facebook. They usually go live on Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m., and they even do requests. Those of you used to giving during our typical weekend services, we ask that you consider giving online. As a reminder, you can give anytime securely with the Give button on the church's homepage at logchurchpa.org. Please join me as we open in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this time we get to spend together. Lord, I just pray that you speak through Pastor Sam today. Use this teaching and use this message to reach each and every one of our hearts. In whatever way that needs to be done, Lord, just open up our eyes, our ears, and our hearts. Help us to draw closer to you. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you and love you for everything you do in our lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We all have that picture, don't we? The picture that when your family members open up that photo album, they take that picture out, you cringe, right? Because you are about to hear the story, the story of your most embarrassing moment. Maybe it was when you were a toddler and you said something really, you know, bad at a family function and, you know, everyone laughed, but, you know, your parents never let you hear the end of it. Or maybe it was that time that you made a really, really bad decision in school or maybe with some sort of past experience. Maybe if, you know, if we're being honest, there might be something involving a past marriage. And when that picture gets brought up, you get that feeling of shame. And that is no truer anywhere in scripture than it is with regard to Simon Peter. Now, if you've been around the church for any length of time, or if you maybe have a background in uh, some sort of spiritual Christian connection, you know who Peter is, you know, one of the apostles. He had a lot of notable things about him. Uh, One of the things about Peter that was interesting is Peter is a lot of the times highlighted as a person of firsts. He's the first person to, you know, jump out of the boat to meet Jesus when he's walking on the water. You know, he's the first person that you see often talking in a a room setting where Jesus is teaching his disciples, and Peter's the one that we see a, a dialogue with. Peter's that guy. If we were to talk to Peter there's a good chance that the gospel of Mark would be that picture that is completely painted of him that he wouldn't want you to bring out in a party. Threaded through Mark's gospel, his writing, we see this picture of Peter that starts to develop. And that's what we're going to look at here today. I want you to first realize, before we have a broken faith, we have to look at what it's like to have what I call a found faith a found faith. Okay, so that's the first thing. You have to find faith. And what does that mean? A found faith means that God showed up. Okay, a found faith means that God showed up. So there's Jesus, this religious leader. He has tons of people that are surrounding him constantly. I mean, he was really, really popular, really super popular at the time, so much so that thousands of people would gather to hear him speak. Because of this, There was a lot of speculation concerning who Jesus was because nobody could really get a good consensus. And here's the conversation. Let's get right into the story with Peter and him. It says in Mark chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And he just has this discussion. Who are people saying that I am? And somebody's like, oh, you're Elijah the prophet. You're this, you're that. They have all these ideas. But he asks specifically, who do you say that I am? We'll get back to that in a moment. He asked this to Peter. And Peter answered him, pay attention to this. In verse 29, he says, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a deep dive into this for a moment because this is so important. There's a good chance that some of you, even if you've been in our church for a long time, when you hear Christ, you're like, well, what does that mean? Like, is that like his last name? No, no, no. The Christ is actually a term referred to 
the office of Jesus, meaning the position that he holds. Christ literally means the anointed one. Anyone that listen to this, that we're gathered around hearing this conversation, anyone that would hear that Jesus was the Christ, they would know exactly what that meant. And this was an Old Testament prophecy that there was going to raise this anointed leader who was called the anointed one or the Messiah. And the Old Testament essentially referred to him as the deliverer, that he was going to come into history. He was going to bring the Israelites, God's people, the Jews, out of captivity, and he was going to deliver them. Uh, He was known by having the strength and the power of God within him. When you hear the Messiah, the Jews right now are still waiting for the Messiah to come. They're still waiting. But Jesus here by Peter is referred to as the Messiah. So this is a really, really big deal. And we often don't realize that when we think of Jesus Christ, Christ refers to him and what he's doing. He is the anointed one of God. Now, pay attention to this more. As the deliverer of the Jews, and really you have to understand this, he's talking to mostly Jewish people. He was going to deliver them out of the hands of oppression. At the time that this was taking place, the Jews were under Roman oppression. Now, some people, and I, I see it a lot online right now, we're like, okay, is this government oppression we're under? Like, we're not allowed to do certain things. And, you know, a lot of the, this stuff is going on is in the, in the service of public health, right? Well, back then, the Romans had control because they had control. It had nothing to do with health. It had nothing to do with saving lives. They were in control of what the Jews did. They were in control of what the Jews could do in their areas. They basically let them have peace. But at the same time, the Jews weren't entirely free. And so there was this expectation, okay, you know, the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to free us from Rome. We're not going to have to answer to Rome. We're not going to have to answer to Caesar. This is going to be the deliverance that we're looking for. So when Peter said that Jesus was the Christ, he was saying, you are God's chosen deliverer. You are the deliverer. Now, I want to tell you this today, okay? Regardless of how much that means to you, right now, wherever you are, it used to be that you coming to church made you a religious person. I don't know if you know this or not, but people can't come to church anymore, okay? So you're saying, okay, so I, can't, I haven't been to my church. I feel like I'm out of this. Some of you, you might not be connected to the log church and you're going to the other church and you're kind of surfing right now. You're church surfing right now. That's a new thing. It's happening. You know, there are people that are, they're, you'll watch three or four church sermons on Sunday. You're double dipping and that's fine, okay? But you're like, I don't know. You know, I don't have a church right now. None of us do. So what makes me a spiritual person? What makes you a spiritual person? What makes you a person of faith? Ready? It's how you answer the question of who is Jesus. Right now, if you know someone that you're like, I don't know if this person's religious. I'm not sure if they have a relationship with Jesus. Here's how this works. You have to be able to answer the question, who is Jesus? Okay? And Peter says, oh, I know who you are. You're the Messiah. You're the deliverer. You're the coming one. You're the one that's going to save us from this oppression. You're that person. And right now, if you are sitting there in your living room, if you're in your bedroom, if you're watching this late at night because you, you know, woke up and you're having trouble sleeping, wherever you are, I want you to know that the same question is today. If you are a Christian, what that means is you have found faith in Jesus through Jesus. That means that you believe that Jesus came to this world, he died on the cross, and he rose again to save you from your sins. The most important question you will ever ask in your life, and the one that you will answer that's the most important question is, who is Jesus? It really all comes down to that. It boils down to that. I don't care what your denomination is. Just being honest. I don't even care if you grew up in a Christian home. That doesn't matter. My only concern to you is what do you believe about Jesus? So I don't want to talk about debating things. I don't want to talk about, you know, different things that you might have and theories. Who is Jesus to you? That's how you know if you have faith or not. Okay? So found faith. 
Peter is commended. He's like, Jesus is like, yes, this is my identity. Peter is commended for knowing that he's the Messiah. Jesus even says, look, God revealed this to you. This isn't something that you found on your own. This is something that God revealed to you because this is the truth, and it is the truth. He has an understanding of who Jesus is. So Peter has this revelation. And Peter is, you know, I mean, he is, he is full of that pride. He's got that. And some of you are like that. You're new to the church. You're new to being around people. And you're ready to storm the gates of hell with a squirt gun. And I commend you. But that's not exactly what this sermon is about. Because we see in Mark's story, another conversation happens between Jesus and Peter. And it happens really close to when Jesus is going to be crucified. He brings the disciples up for a meeting in the upper room. And the meeting essentially has a couple components to it. He explains to them how he's going to be betrayed. He explains to the disciples how he's going to leave them for a time, and he tries to encourage their hearts, and how, you know, he's going to be killed. And Peter kind of whispers to him, he goes, these other guys, they might leave you. He's like, I'm not leaving you. I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm true. And you know what Jesus says to him? You know what Jesus says to him, right? You know, First of all, Peter says in Mark 14, even though they will fall away, I will not. Peter, or Jesus responds to Peter by saying this in verse 30. You're going to deny me three times. He said, oh, you're not going to fall away once. He's like, oh, no, no, you're not just going to run away. No, 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 you are going to deny me. You're going to deny me. And Peter's like, what? What are you talking about? Me? I'm the guy that knows who you really are. I'm the guy that's ready to fight for you, bro. I'm the guy that's going to make sure nobody, nobody said, you're my boy. You're my, do they still say that now? In a COVID world, do they say, are you my boy? Well, I'm saying it. You're my boy. I'm not going to let anybody touch you. Are you kidding me? And Jesus goes, yeah, you're right. That's because you're going to deny me. How you like that? Spoiler alert. You're a bad disciple. This is where it's heading. And I want to let you know right now, This is where some of you are. Your faith is broken. I know. You don't have to say it. I know. I know that it is. And there are times that if you can control, if you have a routine, if you have a plan with God, you're doing great. I mean, honestly, you're killing it. But right now, things are a little stinky, right? It's not ideal. It's not. And There's that moment when that threshold where is your faith real or not? So Peter is given a prophecy by Jesus, you're going to deny me. And that leads to the second thing, which is broken faith. Broken faith. Broken faith happens when God doesn't show up the way that we expect. Found faith is when you realize God is here. I know who Jesus is. God is here. Broken faith is when you experience something where God doesn't show up the way that you expect. He doesn't show up the way that you expect. So what happens? There's Peter. He's insisting he's not going to deny Jesus. And now comes the moment of truth. They're standing there, Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying. The soldiers come up to arrest him, to put him to death. It was a big conspiracy. You can read it through the gospel of Mark if you'd like. I'd recommend you read that whole entire gospel. It's a great way to really introduce yourself to the faith. But Jesus is there. His disciples are supposed to be praying and they're snoozing. And so here comes the crew and they're ready to take Jesus out. As soon as they go to apprehend him, you know what Jesus does? Doesn't do anything. He says, hey, I've been with you in the temple. I could have let you apprehend me at any time, and I didn't. And now this is your time. This is what's going to happen. This is what was predicted. And the moment that they go to advance on him, Peter pulls out a sword. He's got a sword. Now, the Bible describes it as a sword. It's actually a dagger. It was shorter than a sword, and it was designed for close contact, close combat. It could be concealed easily. And he goes, and he swipes at the ear of one of the servants. And just so you know, he wasn't aiming for the ear. He was trying to kill him. And it says this in Mark chapter 14, verse 47, one of the soldiers he goes after, says, but one of those who stood by, this is Peter, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. 
Now this was it. Peter's like, all right, here we go. Braveheart moment. He's like, freedom, right? Like they're going to go and they're going to kill all of the people that are coming against Jesus. And this is it. And now the Messiah is going to show up and the Messiah is going to deliver them, right? And the Messiah is going to come in a really big way and bring back the rule of the kingdom. And God is here. Only that's not what happened at all. Not at all. You know what happens? Jesus heals the person who Peter assaults. He puts his ear back on, which I think would be really cool to see. He puts his ear back on. He heals him. And then he submits himself to captivity and to execution, just like that. And there's Peter standing there. And look at what happens. In Mark chapter 14, verse 50, it says, they all left him and they fled. Why? Because their faith was broken. See, a lot of us that say, well, Peter denied Jesus. He, he denied him and they, they fled and all this because they were fearful. Well, remember, <laughs> don't forget the first part of the story. Peter had his sword out. Peter was ready hand-to-hand combat. Why did he flee? Because Jesus didn't do what Peter expected him to do. And we see that later on, while Jesus is there and being questioned by the authorities, which is really just a sham, like they were going to kill Jesus no matter what. You know that. Watch the Passion of the Christ. You know what happens in that story, right? So this wasn't a real, real serious trial. Peter is standing there, and he has three times that he's asked who, yeah, you know, G, you're that guy. You're the guy that was always with him. You're that loud mouth that's always talking about him. And you know what Peter does? He denies him. And it says after the third time that he denies him, he remembers the prophecy, he hears the rooster crow, and this is what it says in Mark chapter 14, verse 72, that Peter broke down and wept because that's what happened when our faith breaks. And that's what happens for a lot of us. And that's what's happening to you right now. You see, you expected that you were a Christian and you were absolved from what's going on in this world. We do. We think that we're absolved. We actually think for a moment that we're going to live in this world in a holy heavenly bubble and that we're not going to have to struggle with things like depression and insecurity and uncertainty. And we're not going to have awkward conversations with our employers and our landlords about not being able to pay our rent or not being able to afford utilities. And we're not going to have to look and see how we're going to make a new normal out of what's going on. And what has happened is, God hasn't showed up the way that you expect. And when that happens, something inside of you breaks. That faith, that broken thing starts to happen to you. And that's exactly where Peter is. He's broken. He breaks down, he cries, and he goes back to his normal job. That's not where the story ends, thank God. Three days later, just as Jesus promised, he rises from the grave. And he appears, the angel appears to women at the tomb, right? They tell them the news. And this is what the angel says. I want you to pay attention. This is the most important part of the story. Watch this right now, wherever you are. Watch this. It says, the angel tells them, go and tell Jesus' disciples. This is in Mark chapter 16, verse 7. Go and tell them that he's alive. Go and tell him to come here. He says, go and tell his disciples and Peter. Make sure you get Peter. Make sure you get Peter. Bring him back. Bring him to the tomb. You know why that's important? Because this is where I want you to go. That leads me to the final place of where I believe that God is calling us all right now that are struggling with broken faith, and it's this simple place. It's a restored faith, a restored faith, and a restored faith. You know what it says? A restored faith simply says, I don't care how God shows up as long as he shows up. I don't care how God shows up as long as he shows up. I want to get you to that place of submission. I want to get you to that place of being able to say, I know that this isn't where I expect to be. I know that God hasn't shown up in my finances, but God has still shown up. I know that I may not know how this is all going to shake out in my life, but God still showed up. I know that I feel alone right now because I can't be with certain members of my family, but that doesn't mean that God hasn't showed up. A restored faith says that as long as God shows up, 
I'm going to be okay. And I want you to know that God reached out to Peter and he restored him. They have some conversations. And God meets Peter right where he is. I want to let you know the same God that met Peter where he was is the God that meets us right here in our broken faith. It's the God that transforms us just by our answering of one question. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the God who restores the broken. And he might not have shown up where you expected or how you expected but he showed up. He's here. He's still your God. He's still your Savior. And you are not alone. So take that truth to heart. And all the parts of your faith that are broken and crackling at the edges, let that truth restore let it heal you. Let's pray. Father, at this moment, I pray that we would answer this question first. Who is Jesus to us? If you are listening to this, watching us on Facebook, watching this on any of our platforms online, Here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you do not know who Jesus is, if you want to have a relationship with God, if you want to start that relationship at this moment, if God is working in your heart, I want you to pray this prayer with me. My heavenly father, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe just as this text teaches that Jesus came down, he died for our sins and he rose from the grave. I accept his forgiveness. I accept who he is. I turn from my sin and I turn completely to you. If you just prayed that prayer, let somebody know. Say that you did it. Tell us. Let somebody in your family know. Let somebody know that you know who Jesus is and you have a relationship with God. Now, Father, for every other person that's listening to this, I pray you'd heal us. Restore our faith. Call us back. Let us not be moved by things in our lives where you haven't shown up where we expect, but instead let us just celebrate that you showed up, that you promised that we were not alone, that you promised that you will not leave us nor forsake us. Now we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. What we'd like you to do as soon as we wrap up here is head over to the Log Church Connect group on Facebook. We do a live lobby session after the Saturday night service and our three Sunday morning services. This is a great way to talk about the sermon, have some fun, and catch up with friends. Make sure you check out all of our children and youth ministries on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Please keep the food donations coming. You can drop off donations Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. down at the cafe. We've been able to feed hundreds of families because of your generosity. Also, make sure you stop by and pick up some food for yourself or perhaps a neighbor or loved ones. We want to make sure no one is going hungry during these difficult times. And if you're looking for daily encouragement, make sure you check out our daily devotions with Pastor Mike and Pastor Sam. There are at least 18 prophecy snapshot videos from Pastor Mike alone. Have a great day, everybody, and God bless.